Hi everyone, my name is Serjan Kafle. I'm also from the multimedia team at LinkedIn. Today I'll be discussing temporal deep learning methods for video understanding. Temporal deep learning methods address problems surrounding action recognition and involve modeling the temporal aspect of a video. Examples of this are listed here, which we'll discuss along the building blocks used by many of these methods. So 3D convolution is fundamental for a lot of these uh, techniques. And just to recall what 2D convolution does, there's a two-dimensional kernel, convolutional kernel, uh, and there's one of these kernels for each input channel J and output channel I. The difference with 3D convolution is now we have an extra dimension along uh, the frames. And so what this will do is it'll involve a 3D convolutional kernel uh, along with an extra sum in the convolution operation as highlighted in blue in, in this equation. So it's, all, it's almost identical to what 2D convolution does, except now we, we have an extra temporal dimension uh, to sum across. Let's look at this pictorially. In the case of a single input and a single output channel. So here we'll have a, just a 3D kernel of dimension two by two by two. Given an input video of a single channel, we use the 3D convolutional kernel to cycle through this input video. So here, this video is, is essentially there's along the x dimension, you have the width, along the y dimension, you have the height, and along the t dimension, you can think of it as successive frames uh, for this input video or input video clip. So each convolutional st uh, step is carried out as, it, as this is showing. And at each step, what we do is it's a sum operation that is carried out on the product of the kernel weights and the input. Each convolutional step contributes to a single output unit as shown here. The dimension of this output as denoted by the purple, di uh, purple box here is smaller than the input due to no initial zero padding in the input video. Uh, this is very similar to the property that 2D convolutional layers have as well. The other aspect of, of, of the 3D convolutional layer is when there are multiple input channels. So again, let's focus on the case where you have just a single output channel, but you have three input channels and these can correspond to RGB channels like red, green, and blue for a video. And so as, as we can see here for the red channel, we have the first kernel applied uh, leading at, at a certain spatial temporal position leading to a single output. Same thing happens to the second channel. And finally, the, uh, this again happens to the uh, last channel here. So what we do now is to combine the contributions from each of the input channels, we just take a sum operation and this contributes to a single output unit uh, in, this, in this final output we, sh we show here. An example of 3D convolution layers is a C3D architecture, which uses homogeneous three by three by three kernels with stride one. And pooling layers are also added in and these pooling layers behave sim similarly to the diagram shown before, but just they use a max operation instead of a weighted sum. So finally, after like uh, successive 3D convolutional layers along with pooling layers, there's a, there's a series of fully connected layers and then a soft max operation to output class prediction labels um, that can relate to actions. And so the key contribution here is the, the, uh, the idea of contributing like 3D convolution to uh, a network of, of this type. And, uh, and, and they apply this to four different benchmarks. So um, that, that is one of the, the, the key contributions for uh, C3D networks. Another technique is called early, late, and slow fusion. So these are really three techniques that we can break, uh, break them down into. And so for early fusion, uh, we have an input of n frames and immediately use a 3D convolution layer of temporal width equal to n. This effectively does not move the kernel along the temporal dimension and instead immediately reduces the temporal width of the output to one. The output can then be treated as a 2D input to a 2D CNN. So this is termed early fusion since all temporal information is aggregated at once. Late fusion on the other hand, just applies a 2D CNN to the first uh, frame and to the last frame. Um, and finally, a fully connected layer takes into account both uh, outputs for both frames. So this is light fusion because the, the first and last frame are processed uh, separately from each other. Finally, slow fusion is, um, tries to incorporate like temporal information as the layers progress upwards. 
And so this is done by in introducing, you can think of it as a proper 3D convolutional network with temporal kernel width uh, less than n. And after a con 3D layer, they have a spatial pooling and a normalization. And spatial pooling means we, we do a pooling operation on the spatial uh, dimension, but no spatial, no, sorry, no pooling on the temporal dimension. In terms of results on the Sports 1 million data set, the author showed that the slow fusion performed the best compared to early and late. Um, and so these are the hit at one and hit at five metrics. The next important technique is called two stream networks, which is independent of the 3D convolution idea. This architecture incorporates motion information by leveraging optical flow displacement fields described earlier and passing the flow through a 2D CNN. Specifically for a given input video, a random frame is selected from the clip. The spatial stream 2D CNN just takes that single frame uh, image as input to output a class prediction label. Uh, similarly, the temporal stream, instead of taking in a visual frame, it takes into account the displacement field for successive like L consecutive frames uh, starting at that frame tau. And it does this by this technique called optical flow stacking, which we'll describe next. Uh, but the, the, the idea here is that you have two streams. One is a spatial, one is a temporal. They have, their architectures for the continents are, are very similar, uh, almost like identical in some senses, uh, other than the input being fed in. And the final class score probability that's predicted is a function of both the um, spatial stream and temporal stream. So optical flow stacking is the main, uh, is one of the main contributions of like the two stream network idea. And recall that the uh, optical flow can be thought of as yielding a displacement field uh, for every single frame. And this displacement field vector can be broken down into a U and V component. And the vector points from some frame T to some frame T plus one for a given pixel position. Now consider a frame tau, which is the same frame, same uh, random frame selected for the spatial stream. What we'll do is we'll select L consecutive frames uh, until tau plus L minus one. And each of these frames has its own displacement field. Now, because these the, each displacement vector has a U and V component, we can break uh, the displacement field into a U grid and a V grid, as shown here. And the next step in the optical flow stacking algorithm is just to stack uh, for every single one of these L frames, the U components and the V components, as shown here. And so what this yields is a H by W by 2L input volume, where 2L is the number of channels being used as input to the 2D CNN. In terms of results, two stream network uh, outperforms slow fusion considerably. And the authors also tried out uh, the, just a single spatial stream or just a temporal stream. The two stream, it shows the utility on, on combining both streams together. Another technique for video representation leverages an unsupervised training criterion based on an encoder decoder LSTM networks. The network is trained for input reconstruction and future frame prediction. The actual frame features used come from this FC6 layer from the two stream network as highlighted in this, in this diagram uh, on the left diagram. And the encoder network, the encoder LSTM network takes each frame for each time step as input, each frame representation. And the final hidden representation of the encoder is used as input to the two decoders. So one of the decoders is input reconstruction, which is trying to reconstruct your input frame representations uh, that were in, inserted into the encoder. And the future frame prediction is meant to now output uh, future frame representations based on the input clip you've entered for the video. So now coming back to 3D CNNs, uh, a network like termed I3D introduces a concept of inflating 2D CNNs such as Inception V3 or ResNet 101 to 3D CNN counterparts. The architecture change is as simple as just taking a 2D convolutional kernel and expanding it into a 3D convolutional kernel. However, this also enables us to, uh, to use an interesting technique to use a pre-trained 2D CNN to initialize parameters for a 3D CNN. How this is done is as follows. Consider a single image. Um, we can actually expand this image to be a video by just replicating that image multiple times. And one property we want to have is now if you input the still image into a 2D CNN, 
uh, and have a certain output. We want to replicate that output by in, in, uh, inputting this, this uh, boring video into the 3D CNN. And so this can, this can, to do this, what we need to do is we need to first uh, have, we need to first train a 2D CNN using uh, ImageNet data or any sort of uh, image data set um, in, the, in the community. And what this will do is this will train a 2D convolutional kernel, a set of 2D convolutional kernels. We can use these to initialize a 3D convolutional kernel by just taking the uh, respective 2D counterpart and dividing by the temporal kernel width. Uh, in this case, t, uh, as in the equation, but in, in this specific example, that would be three. The same idea can be applied to two stream networks. First, instead of just randomly pick, uh, first instead of just randomly picking a frame from a video, you can consider multiple frames for both the spatial and temporal streams. Now, what this will do is this will actually let us use three D convolutional layers for both the spatial stream and the temporal stream. And now, another contribution for two stream inflated three D convnets is that um, for that three D CNN, we can initialize them by using that same technique uh, of inflating two D CNNs, three D CNNs, and pre training the two D CNN on ImageNet. So another technique. Uh, attempts to leverage skip connections common in successful 2D CNN architectures. Uh, so the R3D network, it, what it does is it introduces a concept of a residual block. Expanded, this is just two conf 3D layers in succession with a skip connection uh, from the input to the output of the second uh, 3D conv layer. So as, as shown here, the, the, like, the way this, uh, the two layers are, are broken in for the single residual block is if you have an output channel of 128, both the both con 3D layers have channels, uh, have 128 output channels. And then for example, with a stride of two by two by two, only the first layer has the same stride and the second layer uh, has a stride of just one by one by one. So it's effectively um, striding just two by two by two each time for, the, for this residual block. The final residual block has 512 output channels, uh, which is then used as input into a spatial temporal averaging, average pooling layer. So all this is doing is for every channel is taking average over all spatial locations and temporal locations to yield just one, one output, uh, one real number per, um, per channel. So this gives you a 512 dimensional representation, which is then used to predict class probabilities. So, the R2 plus 1D networks introduce a factorizing approach to take a 3D convolutional layer and break it into two different layers by reducing the kernels into 2D and, and 1D. In terms of the architecture, this introduces two layers uh, in succession. The M intermediate channels, uh, as shown, uh, are a hyperparameter that can be tuned. And the author set this so that the number of parameters after you do this factorizing is roughly equivalent to before you do the factorizing. So it's just a way to break down uh, a single 3D con layer into two different uh, 3D con layers that are less expensive um, and are, are, can be considered as just 2D convolution than 1D convolution along the temporal dimension. In terms of results in the kinetics data set, R2 plus 1D provides value over just uh, R3D on the kinetics validation set. On UCF 101 and HMDV 51, we can see that the two stream network with 3D convolutions using inflated 2D networks performs the best. So another set of technique is called non-local neural networks. And just, to, uh, just as a refresher, uh, what we'll do is like recall on 3D convolution how for a single in output unit, only the contribution from a certain local region is accounted for. And this is controlled by your dimension for the, for the 3D kernel used. So in non-local neural networks, we can, this is actually very similar to a self-attention mechanism used in NLP. So in, in, this, in this scheme, we can actually think of the uh, input as a collection of pixel features, which are taken from each of the, uh, each of the input channels. Now we will actually use three weight matrices to have linear transform of these, uh, linear transforms of these pixel features. The first two, W theta and W phi, they are used to compute a soft attention weight for pixel position x, y, t to position i, j, k, as shown in the, in the left part of this equation. The W, g weight is used just as a linear transform of the pixel feature. The C of v term in the equation is a normalization factor meant for the attention weights to sum to one. 
Now the intermediate output Z is then multiplied by another uh, weight matrix and added into back into the pixel feature to uh, form your final output. And this, this is just akin to using a skip connection uh, directly from the input to O of X, Y, T uh, with the contribution of W, Z times Z, Y, X, Y, T, which comes from the attention mechanism. Um, so because of this skip connection, this actually enables us to plug in non-local layers to any sort of three, uh, any sort of video architecture that's already there. So here are two example uh, video clips with arrows corresponding to high attention weights. So as desired in both the basketball example and the tennis example, um, the represent like the the output representation of certain points focus on salient areas in the entire input clip. Finally, the last technique we'll discuss is slow fast networks. The major innovation here is considering that to understand visual signal, we don't need that high of a frame rate, whereas for motion information, we do. To integrate this into a model, two pathways are created slow and fast. In the slow pathway, we sample every tau frames, where tau is a hyperparameter. In the paper, they set this to 16. Next, an additional hyperparameter alpha considers how often to sample the fast pathway. Again, in the paper, this is set to eight, so that 16 divided by eight equals two, that's how many frames uh, are sampled for the fast pathway. So in the overall scheme of the architecture, there's one more uh, hyperparameter that's involved, which is beta. This, and this is, can be treated as a way to scale down the number of channels for the fast pathway to make that network less parameter intensive. In this diagram, we can see that for the fast pathway, there are more frames, but less channels. Lateral connections are used to fuse information from both pathways. In terms of results on kinetics, we find that non-local networks outperform I3D two-stream and R2 plus 1D two-stream. Slow fast with a ResNet 101 architecture outperforms non-local R101. Combining slow fast with non-local, however, performs the best. To summarize, a variety of temporal deep learning methods exist for action recognition. Variants of uh, 3D convolutions, the slow, fast, non-local, and two-stream networks form the backbone of many of the state-of-the-art models.